previously on podcast without pretense. You know, guys, I have a feeling this next movie is going to be a real revelation. I can't wait till episode 105 because episode 100 sucked. Yeah, episode 100, worst episode we've ever recorded and really blasphemous. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Podcast Without Pretense. I'm Maya Zachar. I'm Jonathan Strickland. And I'm Eric Sandin. And together, we make up three of the seven seals. Harbor seals. Not the biblical ones. <laughs> arf, arf, arf. That's sea lion. So, uh, before we get into... Well, first of all, happy 100th episode, you two. Happy 100th episode, yeah. everybody. I we did a class. thing. <laughs> when we were on, ep- yeah, when we were on episode, uh, one, when we were on episode, uh, one, who would have thought that we would have over the course of the next 12 years, eventually <laughs> in our weekly series, get to episode 100. <laughs> yeah. And, and if it wasn't for the help of a GFQ network, we would probably not be doing this. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to switch this shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the fact that the fact that I has, has proven to us time and again, his uh, his tireless and and enduring willingness to listen to an episode no more than the time when he's actually recording it. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, like, what's the opposite well, of tireless? Because I I think I've been tireful, if that's a word, when it comes to yes, <laughs> tirefully <laughs> recording. <laughs> I am simply basically like a junkyard with full of tires. How much I I have no idea where I'm going with this. Somebody save that's, me from my own pun. Okay, well, let, let me just go ahead and say this. First of all, with 100 episodes behind us, uh, it was pretty late in the game when we decided to add the little gimmick of challenging ourselves to watch movies on Netflix just to see how far we could get for some of the movies that were really predicted to be stinkers for us uh, without the use of any second screen or distraction. We added that you know, pretty late in the game. Before that, it was just us talking about whatever, which we still do. We just now also have this movie thing. Uh, I never in that time thought that we would choose a movie that could end up causing massive problems in our lives if we criticize it too harshly. <laughs> and yet, well, rock and roll episode Frankenstein, 100, we have. Rock and roll that? Frankenstein brought uh, rock and roll Frankenstein brought upon a lot of. How do we artfully say this movie is incredibly homophobic? homophobic yeah. and yeah. Well, you don't offensive. have to artfully say it. Well, the, like, but it was the, also who, who's it, whose feelings Rock are going to hurt? Frankenstein, had we had we not criticized it, that would have been the problem. <laughs> True, but like yeah. okay, so there's there's a lot of uh, networks out there whose names will go unnamed that are somewhat homophobic and have a bunch of old school points of view. Uh, then they they say it in a subtle way to explain how offensive Rock and Roll Frankenstein was. Just to describe it was offensive. Like, I think. <laughs> I think Jonathan explained fact, when. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Jonathan explained say, what. When when Jonathan explained the reason why he stopped watching the video is because a broomstick was sticking out of the priest's ass. Yeah. Because somebody had impaled him. That's yeah. offensive <laughs> by itself, even with with context. So yes, this is different. Well, the fact the fact different. that the three of us were, if not offended, at least we all definitely uh, acknowledged how how it was in such poor taste and that none of us were condoning the film. I think that made it a little easier on us. This one is tricky. Okay. I, I live in the Bible belt in the South. And well, that's true. Movie, okay. The movie, by the way, the, the movie, the, yeah, the movie that Eric Sandine picked was left <laughs> behind two tribulation force technically he wanted any of the left behind movies and we decided that it would be funny out of this trilogy of movies to pick the second one instead of the first one and jump into the middle of the series with no context for any of the characters no idea what what the <laughs> i don't think any context began. was really needed. <laughs> well i mean we knew that it takes place after the rapture i mean that that's the whole premise of the left behind yeah. series we knew that but we didn't know any of the characters. We didn't know their relationships to each other. We didn't know like what the actual story arcs of these characters were going into the second movie. 
and we had no idea where it was going. So before we even discuss this movie, I decided I'd go back and look into the Left Behind book series just by reading like the Wikipedia <laughs> entry. I didn't I didn't read any of the books. Do you guys without looking it up, can you guys guess how many books are in that series? Six. Yeah, I yeah. was going to say six, actually, but add add 10 to that. And you're oh. right. 16 <laughs> books in the Left Behind series. Now, do you know are these are they written as young adult novels? Is that what? No, there are no. young adult novels. There are 43 of those. Oh, yeah. It must be <laughs> for the adult novels, it is 16 books. Um, so Left Behind 2 Tribulation Force roughly follows the second book from what I can tell. So the first book left behind would be the first film, roughly. The second film left behind two is, is roughly all but the final few chapters of the second book. And left behind three is essentially the last 50 pages yeah. of the second book. I read that on Wikipedia too. It's, so, it's yeah. 50 pages for an hour and a half long movie. <laughs> And, and it's and it's also and I'm going to talk about part three because I actually spoiler alert. I actually did watch part three after watching part two. I kind of felt like I wanted to see where this was going. And of course, what I didn't realize was there would be no resolution because it doesn't get to the well, last part. So, of so the even before books. we get to that, I didn't even realize they are they are already rebooting the Left Behind series. Yeah. With Nicolas uh, Cage. There is a Nicolas Cage movie coming out. I didn't know that. <laughs> and I, I would have watched that movie. <laughs> well, Eric, let's let's take one torturous <laughs> movie at a time, shall we? But no, I did watch the third one, and I gotta say, I, I have I, I I took about a paragraph of notes about the second movie. I took a page and a half of notes in the third <laughs> movie. So I will uh, after we discuss the second movie, I will treat you to my my notes on the third one. Keeping in mind that the third film ends more or less with kind of a cliffhanger situation and there's no fourth film. So it's never resolved. Uh, and uh, what's what's really weird is how the second movie ends and then how the third movie begins, because while the third movie ends with a cliffhanger, the second film ends with sort of a, a semi resolution Um and the third film kind of jumps ahead far enough where it doesn't acknowledge that resolution at all. But anyway, let's talk about the second movie, shall we? How far did you guys get with no distractions? I asked. Uh, far, well, I got technically zero because I had a beer before it. So I'm like, well, technically I'm under the influence. That's zero. Um, <laughs> so and then I got I like holding strong at his record of most films <laughs> at zero. It's true. Because <laughs> we added beer as a distraction, even though I did watch, I watched about uh, twenty minutes of it uninterrupted. After that, if you but you had that. you had what one beer? Yes, and you had one beer before you started watching it. Yeah, or so were just, you, like, had were you still drinking it while no. it was on? Then no. I think with one beer before you watch, <laughs> I can allow it. So twenty minutes. Okay, Eric. 20 minutes. There you go. Thank you. Mine. Mine was about. I think it was 20 minutes because I actually sent an email to both of you to reply to Jonathan after I started watching it because I was actually so excited about how ridiculous it was already that I was yeah. like, oh, crap, I have to respond to Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got 56 minutes into this before uh, I had any distractions. Uh, and then my mom, movie. Yeah, my mom called me. Uh, and I, and so I, I paused the movie and I took her call. So, uh, I probably could have gone further into this. So now we know basically the, the left behind series is again, it's, it takes place after the event of the rapture, which, uh, for those who do not know, uh, certain denominations, uh, of Christianity view this as an event in which the true followers of Christ will be called home. They'll ascend to heaven, leaving behind all the rest of us, like like me. I would include myself. <laughs> I like here. how you say the rest of us. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, us as in the people who would be remain in. behind. I do not presume to know your faith, but I am an atheist. So, um, 
so yeah, well, I would be left behind. Well, they did say in the movie and left behind too that all of the children on the earth went missing. So if Jonathan yeah. fits the description of a child, which is possible, right. because if I, have, I mean, if you're thinking, if you're thinking in terms of can, God and you're thinking of biblical ages, Old Testament, I'm talking here. Jonathan and I were pretty young. We could be a child. Well, yeah. I think I think what they're saying is that if you're not old enough to have made the decision for yourself. And I do have the brain of a child. It's actually right over there. But I don't uh, think I count as being so young as to not be able to make a, a decision for myself, uh, which I think would mean I would be left behind. At any rate, the characters in, in the movie and presumably the book series, I think the, the main characters in the book series are the same ones as in the movies. Uh, uh, in the first film, I assume they mostly deal with the, the shocking event of millions upon millions of people on earth mysteriously disappearing without a trace. Uh, and then by the second movie, they've figured out what's going on. It's the rapture. The ones who are left behind are not the ones who are followers in Christ. And, uh, they have to figure out what they do from that point forward. Some people don't, see any religious connection to the events at all. They think there's something else going on, uh, which is weird because it's hard to, to explain just the mystery, the complete disappearance of hundreds of millions of people. Not just that, you know, people didn't drop dead. They're just gone. So that was weird. Right. Uh, also I did, you know, it was one of those things where when I saw it in the movie, I was like, is, is this really, really what happened in the book? And it apparently is the, the antichrist is a Romanian named Nikolai Carpathia. Yep. <laughs> which is almost like the red versus blue joke of naming him Dr. Baron Von Evil Satan. Because Nikolai <laughs> Carpathia, I mean, you, you couldn't come, that, that's like villain in a box. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the, like my one of my first notes is, Oh, come on. He's Russian. <laughs> and that's just after hearing him talk for like two seconds. <laughs> yeah. And, and Carpathia, you know, the same mountain range yep. as Vlad Tepish. Yeah. Dracula. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it, most of my notes actually start pretty late into the movie. Cause I was watching for 56 minutes without taking notes, but generally speaking, you have characters who have, uh, decided to band together and they're trying to figure out how to uh, to limit the Antichrist's influence on Earth, knowing they can't stop it because it's all been foretold in the Bible. So they're unable right. to stop things. The only thing they're able to do is try and save as many people as they possibly can uh, and also do that while contending with the Antichrist trying to stop them. Now, most save, of this kind of save in the Christian sense of the word. Not yes. like they're just running out and, and saving people from gunfire. but No, it's, save, it's literally yeah. <laughs> saving their souls, not their lives. Everyone at this point knows they're going to die, right? <laughs> I mean, like, all, well, at least all the good guys. They, have, they know they're right. going to die. They have resolved themselves to that. In fact, you know, what they're trying to do is try and save as many other souls as possible so as many people go to heaven as possibly can. Um, and, and they'll be rejoin, they'll rejoin their loved ones who they lost during the rapture. Uh, and it, so that's the basic story. And so you, your main character, Kirk Cameron plays your main character, Buck, who is a journalist. Um, and, uh, then you have, uh, a, a, a pilot who has reluctantly taken on faith uh, his daughter, who is Buck's love interest, and a pastor, uh, who is the main person teaching Christ's, you know, wisdom to folks, and it it, it makes no apologies for what it is. It is essentially, you know, it's essentially a series of sermons, really, when you get down to it, and um, and so if you're not at all familiar with uh, Christian theology and the various interpretations of the book of revelations, as well as the other books that mention the end times, it, it, it would seem completely like alien to you. 
For yeah. me, growing up in the South, I was familiar with a lot of this already. Not, I mean, I'm not a Christian, but I'm very, I'm familiar with the faith. And um, so I was able to grasp a lot of these concepts quickly. But as I was doing it, I was thinking like, you know, if I knew nothing, if this were just a fantasy world and the rules were being told to me here, I'd be thinking, this is really weird. <laughs> Well, and, and I think that's the funny part about it is that as I'm watching it and, and, and as I started the, the third one, I, like I started thinking that way. I was like, you know, if I had no idea what these guys were talking about, this would, this would seriously be Harry Potter. Like yeah. it, it makes no sense. There are just rules that exist in this universe that do not exist other places. Yep. What do you think, Ayaz? Okay, so I, have my own, I have my own little notes from like the, my twenty minutes of it because I didn't, I did not, did not finish this movie in the traditional sense. Like I jumped like a middle of it, okay. I jumped like half an hour, and yeah. I felt like I missed nothing. Um, you probably didn't. There's yeah, a whole did. lot of, there's a whole lot of characters planning on what they need to do, but not actually doing anything. Yeah, I really felt like I missed nothing. Uh, okay, so when it comes to the not plot. What would you call this? The details, as you guys want to call it, the actual rules of this. I went to 13 years of Catholic school. Same here. Okay. 13 years. <laughs> 13 years. That, that includes a kindergarten year and 12 regular years. I guess it didn't seem as far-fetched. I'm like, what's the artful way to say this? I don't buy into it. And yep. I don't think that if I, if I never heard these rules before, I probably would be just as critical as I was of Harry Potter, because a lot of that shit makes no sense either. But uh, <laughs> right. it's not really a great idea to say, hey, a very, very important religion. Eh, I don't really get it. But <laughs> I, did it yeah. I did enjoy the fact that Kurt Cameron, Buck Williams, who is constantly called Buck Williams, Buck Williams, Buck Williams. <laughs> yeah. um, he's, he's so down to earth as an anchor man. He's, who, so, like, he's so damned earnest. Yeah, he's got yeah. his leather jacket. He's got a motorcycle. He's like, hey, you didn't have to shoot those kids. Why'd you do that? <laughs> this happens in the very, very early in the movie. Some kids are shot yeah. in front of the in front of the reporter, and he's just like, "What up with that?" And nobody thinks to shoot him. And by the yeah, way, right. one of the oddities in this movie, forget forget well, all the religious all, he's rules. Not black, so <laughs> he's not. Kirk Cameron is still not black. Yeah. But an oddity about this movie right away when That's the, the title. Youths, <laughs> <laughs> Kurt Cameron is not black. <laughs> Still not black. Still not uh, black. Still not black. <laughs> when when these kids are shot, feathers fly out of them. I don't. Maybe I was seeing it wrong on my TV, but it wasn't blood. When they got shot, it looks like someone had exploded an old goose down comforter or pillow. I was like, why would that come out? Feathers. So um, I did think the anchor was quite likable because he's Kurt Cameron, and otherwise. This movie is very realistic. There's this huge discussion of like the UN and having one world currency because the world's yeah. falling apart. And they're like, right. one world currency, that'll never work. I'm like, realistic? Totally buy into that part of the world, not being able to consider that. Although, I guess if we lost hundreds of millions of people on Earth, right. maybe they'd be like, yeah, we can go yeah, on one currency. One what of my fuck? notes was in the beginning was uh, the UN seemed surprisingly powerful and... And effective. Uh, and effective. Uh, and my other note was, this Antichrist guy, I kind of like some of his policies. <laughs> yeah, Baron Von yeah. Evil Satan's got some good ideas. <laughs> yeah. Just, the fact that the UN, you're right, the UN is powerful. Like, I was like, okay, wait a minute, minus the God stuff. This is hilarious. And, a, and apparently has an enforcement has arm. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess the enforcement, since all the, the good people and children were taken away, taken away, the only people left are the evil people in the UN, these heathens, and now they're like just absolute villains. Now they actually the UN is powerful. Although that would right. mean that every so, other country is toothless. I don't know how that so would the, work. So the story here is that Nikolai Carpathia is Secretary General of the UN and is using his position to try and unify the world, this being something that would bring it in alignment with uh, some of the interpretations of prophecies that are in the Bible. Really, it's if you're a futurist. If you, if you follow the futurist interpretations of the Bible, which would suggest that those events would be happening 
either today or in our future, as opposed to something that's already happened in the past, because there are, the, are those interpretations of the Bible as well, then um, you, would, you could interpret the Antichrist rising to power. He's conquering through the promise of peace, getting everyone to willingly sign over their, their essentially existence to him. Right. He's the one who's going to save the world. And he he makes a big show of reluctantly accepting this uh, responsibility. Uh, and it's all all a ploy for him to get control. And the good guys want to try and reveal that he's, in fact, um, plotting against humanity and is a bad thing. And that the only way people can really find safety is by converting to Christianity and truly believing it and meaning it. So part of the plot of this involves the Antichrist, Carpathia, uh, getting a rabbi to essentially proclaim right. that he, the Carpathia, is, is the Messiah so that people will follow Which him was even weird more. To begin with. It's really well, weird it was, because... It was weird to Car begin with. Go ahead. Well, I was saying it's weird because, first of all, Carpathia in an in an announcement says there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's only here. And that he seems to be proclaiming that we should have a world free of religion. But simultaneously, he's seeking to be named the Messiah, which is an right. odd like how assuming that that had actually happened that he had been named the Messiah. Let's say that his plan had continued on. How would he resolve the fact that he had proclaimed to the world, look, let's just face it. All we have is earth itself. That's it. Those people disappeared without a trace and we have no explanation for it, but there's no heaven or hell. There's just earth. How right. does he resolve that with also being named the Messiah? I mean, yeah, I understand and, and why he wants to be named the Messiah because he wants people to follow him. But you can't have that's a cognitive dissonance issue there. Is it though? He could just be like, okay, for those of you who believe what I said the first time, yeah. that stuff's still that stuff's still bullshit. For those of you who believe me now, I'm serious. So he's got yeah. both parties happening. I guess I guess you can argue it that way. It was just a little weird. Oh, poor, we lost Eric. We'll, we'll continue Eric on while so we're... Eric was so upset about And he this had idea. a point, and I, I, I steamrolled him. I'll wait for him to get back. When he gets back, I'll ask him what he wanted to add in. Uh, but yeah, it was... Um, that, that part was very confusing to me. And so when I was watching it and, and seeing like what the plan was, I didn't get it. Eric, you were going to say something before you got uh, bumped off. What's, what were you going to say? Oh, I, I was just going to say, you know, about the, 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 the rabbi or whatever that they were supposed to have say, or rather they changed his speech so that yeah. uh, Nikolai was the Messiah and not apparently, and, and not Jesus, right? So apparently right. this Jewish rabbi had written up this long speech declaring that Jesus was the Messiah that the Jews have been looking for all along. For some reason, I'm highly skeptical that that would ever happen. <laughs> well, to be fair, I don't think that the rabbi had ever written the the speech to reveal that he believed Jesus to be the Messiah. I think the rabbi had written up a a speech that detailed all of these things the Messiah was supposed to possess, all of these different traits uh, the Messiah okay. was maybe supposed I, to possess. Maybe I missed that. Right. Yeah, 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 sure. He, he, yeah, well, he's just essentially it's a laundry list of all the different parts of the Bible that it's describe, a check. yeah, yeah, <laughs> like he has to have been pierced uh, through the torso without breaking a rib. That was one of the, right. the things, and then they were supposed to reveal that that had happened to Carpathia, and therefore he fits that particular criterion. And it would go on and on and on until all the criteria are shown to apply to Carpathia. Thus, the logical argument, Carpathia is the Messiah. So Carpathia's right. people had rewritten the speech to make it Carpathia specifically, whereas the rabbi was just originally going to say, here's what we have to look for if we look for the Messiah. Then Kirk Cameron, you know, Buck, takes it upon himself to escort the rabbi 
to two prophets at the Wailing Wall to have him listen to the prophets preach, where essentially they just say, like, the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> which was apparently enough right. for the rabbi to be convinced that, in fact, uh, Jesus is the Messiah. So you have the world's leading theologian, a rabbi, no less, proclaim that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Messiah, which, as you point out, Eric, is somewhat problematic, right? I mean, (laughs) if nothing else, that particular, it smacks of... Retconning. Not even retconning. I mean, just imagine the, the level of hubris you have to have as a writer, where you've written in a plot element where someone who represents right. a different religion and a high ranking member of that different religion comes out and says, you know what? 3000 years of our history, uh, turns out we should have really been paying attention to what these other guys were saying. We were wrong after that <laughs> whole time, like early we were right, but then there was a point where things changed and we didn't get the new chapters of the book and we were totally wrong. It just, okay. <laughs> it comes across as a little disrespectful. Okay, so um, I was watching the movie out of order because I was fast forwarding yeah. a whole bunch, right? And I see this guy, he's talking about uh, the, the marks of the Messiah and then he eventually says, is Jesus Christ? And I'm like, sitting there, I'm like, why is this a big deal? I'm like, is this guy Jewish? Maybe he's Jewish. So I go backwards. And then I find out yeah. he's the <laughs> rabbi. And I'm like, holy shit, did they just make the rabbi say that? Like, there's a whole sect of Jews for Jesus. I get that. Uh, Judaism is yeah. kind of built in the idea of saying, yeah, that guy was there, not the Messiah. Moving on. We have our own thing going. So yeah. that's how they kind of diverge. So if you're not into religion, that's how they're separate. You know, the Muslims got a whole other thing going. They're like, yeah, that's a prophet. He's not the prophet, but that's a whole similar thing. Not a Messiah much later on. But when I, when I rewound and found out this guy was the, pre, uh, was the rabbi, I was like, no freaking way. And then I looked up it's, the trivia on IMDb. Yeah. Before I before I, I, I seed the floor, Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort reworked some parts of the script to include a stronger evangelistic message. It's like, yeah. I was think, that needed? I, I think, <laughs> well, that was done. Yeah, and it's it, the the first note I have is when the climax of the film involves the world's most respected rabbi proclaiming Jesus Christ as the one and only Messiah. You know you're watching something special. I mean, right. it's just it, it dismisses the entire Jewish faith completely. I mean, well, it has to, right? The very premise well, of this I, movie, the very right. premise of this movie, dictates that the Christian and, and a very specific, a very Christian, specific Christian sect, Christian is uh, interpretation of the Bible is the correct one. Therefore, everyone else has to be wrong. By the very just just by using logic, but at the same time, when you remove yourself from that, you know you don't live in that world, or at least I don't believe we live in that world. Then, when you remove yourself from that and you look at it more from an outsider perspective, d- yeah, that's problematic. I also have some here's some uh, more of my notes. According to Wikipedia, this film was nominated for an award for sound design. Which makes yeah. me wonder how badly the sound design for movies must have been that year. Well, and that was that was terrible. It, it was so it was filmed in two thousand one. What what year was it? I know two thousand two. Two thousand two. Was it released were, date anyway? Were people still putting out features in four by? Th- well, it's four by three, right? Um, um, yes. I, I also don't know what award group nominated them for sound design. It was, the, it was a there Kirk Cameron been, award group. <laughs> it could have been a Christian. It could have been a Christian awards organization. I, it, it didn't necessarily Even say it that, was like it been nominated for something other than sound design, unless they were trying to sh- just throw them a bone. Well, that was one of the awards. I, I wrote down that one specifically because when I saw that it had been nominated for sound design, I thought, well, that's crazy. The movie has at the very near the very beginning. There's the bit where uh, Nikolai Carpathia is accepting the responsibility of leading the world. And it looks like there's a group of about 15 people in the room. 
But whenever you hear applause, it sounds like at least three times that many people applauding. Right. And so, so the number of people you see and the number of people you hear is very different. And then there's a great uh, section where uh, the, the pilot, uh, what's his name, is Rayford or something like that? Uh, anyway, Ray, the pilot, his friend that he convinced to come to the church and hear the pastor preach has decided that it's not for him. He's going to go commit suicide. And he's just spinning a revolver on the table. And the right. sound that they used for the revolver spinning, spinning didn't match the actual motion of the gun. And it didn't sound anything like anything metal spinning on a wooden table. So I, I sat there and I thought, I don't normally notice sound design. I'm, I'm just don't pick up on that sort of thing unless it's really jarring. And these were cases where I was thinking this, this is terrible. I mean, I, I, I've done live Foley that's more convincing than this. Uh, another note is the great exchange. Uh, this, this proves how earnest Kirk Cameron's Buck character is. Thanks to you, Buck, millions have heard the truth. And his response is, thanks to God. Yeah. Oh. Yes. And, and the other thing is when, they, when people are watching what's happening on air, uh, there's a gentleman watching the movie or watching the, 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 the news play out. And he says, yep. thanks, Buck. And then he says, thanks, God, which was like, wow, really? So the satellite hookup, let's let's just thank Buck. <laughs> oh, by the way, I assumed was an anchor. Why is he shooting with the camera unless his camera guy got called up in between when I was fast forwarding? I don't know. Maybe he did. I missed it. <laughs> what the hell? Why I, is the rapture, Buck now the, the rapture's an event that happens one time. It's not something that stutters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, wait a second. I, I'm sure there's some God paperwork that kind of went through the cracks. You know, somebody missed something. And cameraman. I am so sorry. You were meant to have been called home like weeks ago. <laughs> it's like I know. I know it's been hell on sorry, earth, but like you that know what? Thing. It's like Ned Flanders is stuck. He's the camera guy. But I don't remember there being a camera guy. And why the hell is Buck holding the camera? He's also, by the way, while shooting this, watching what's going on without looking through the eyepiece, driving me fucking crazy. And then he's yeah. like looking up and he's like, let me look into it. Oh, the shot's okay. Well, and he's got You're a like, direct satellite uplink from a handy cam, apparently. He's well, the I only mean, one long. with the cam. What was that? <laughs> I said, not for long, that direct satellite uplink is interrupted once Carpathia figures out what's happening. Right. Sure, sure. Um, also, it's only after, it's only during the can rabbi's we, speech that it's foiled. Can we talk about, like, one of the, the actual people that I knew who was in this besides Kirk Cameron? Jason okay. Jones plays young man in church. You okay. may have fast-forwarded through that scene, I is. <laughs> so, Jason Jones, he uh, was a, uh, he's a, uh, uh, Daily Show comedian, and there's like one scene where they're in the church, and he bursts up and like starts talking about getting saved or something like that. And that was the only time in this movie where where I'm like, holy shit, I know wow. that guy. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I have a couple more notes. One of them is that uh, this is one of those movies where the title of the movie is said in the movie. And not only is it said in the movie, so the full title of the movie is Left Behind 2 Tribulation Force. <laughs> Everything in that title, except for the number two, is said verbatim in the, in the movie at some point. So there are people who are like, we're the ones who've been left behind. So I'm like, oh, said the title of the movie. Then later they said, we'll form our own Tribulation Force. <laughs> oh, so they said this subtitle of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a sequel. To when we were left behind, starring Kirk Cameron. Also yeah, confusing. Was... Left behind three, not left behind three. It's left behind. Uh, was it war? Uh, War, uh, world, world, at, at war. world at war. World at war. Yeah. Yeah. So then I've got. Um, as it's weird to have a story in which literally hundreds of millions of people have disappeared, uh, not died, but just totally disappeared, and people resist the explanation of the rapture, which is. Right. <laughs> it's one of those things where you're like, okay, I understand that, that like, yeah, as an atheist, it would take extraordinary circumstances for me to change my, my worldview. But I, I admit, if those extraordinary circumstances <laughs> happened, 
I'd probably end up changing my right. worldview because I would realize that the reality of the situation does not reflect what I thought reality was. Hunts, hundreds of million of people, millions of people are now gone. I may yeah. have been incorrect. <laughs> right. Uh, maybe I need to perhaps consider that this prophecy, which said this very thing would happen, <laughs> has happened. Perhaps I could be wrong. But it's weird how so many people resist it. And I think it's a little simplistic. But anyway, um, uh, let's see. The, the, I have the Baron Von Evil Satan <laughs> note. Oh, the prophets. The two prophets defend themselves. The two prophets at the Wailing Wall, which Nikolai Carpathia essentially makes a demilitarized zone. No one is allowed to go toward the Wailing Wall because he doesn't want the prophets to preach the word of God and then reveal that Nikolai Carpathia is, is not, in fact, the Messiah. Right. Yeah, I think the whole idea. He, the, and and they're referred to as as the witnesses the whole time. I yes, believe, right? they're the two witnesses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They defend themselves by breathing fire. However, they also reveal themselves to be completely invulnerable to bullets. So I'm not sure right. exactly what they're defending themselves against. Yeah. However, it, it, even though they <laughs> they they cannot die, right? They get shot multiple times. They cannot die, and they still yep. fry the living hell out of the guy who's shooting them. Right. It's still necessary to kill these foot soldiers. <laughs> what question, That's, by the way? Now, sure. now, none of us, none of us have seen uh, Left Behind one, right? That's true. True. So, in Left Behind two, obviously, and in Left Behind three, we have Kirk Cameron in all three movies. He seems to be such a good guy. Do we have any idea why he's still on Earth, considering he's apparently well, the greatest guy on Earth, Buck Williams? I imagine. I imagine that <sighs> even though he was a very good guy. He did not actually have Christ in his heart. Right. They do. They do. There's a couple lines uh, where he says, you know, before I was saved or then I was saved or something like that. So okay. there's a there's a there's a mark there somewhere that I assume happens in the first movie. Yeah, I imagine so. I didn't I wasn't curious enough to go back to the first movie. However, uh, in order to explain how phenomenal the third movie is. I have to talk about the conclusion of the second movie. So in the second movie, uh, you know, Buck's plan was to get the to get the rabbi's reaction to the two witnesses on camera in a live feed, reveal it to the world. And that would be the unraveling of Carpathia's plan. Carpathia is able to prevent this by cutting the live feed. So no one is able to actually see the rabbi's reaction. However, he does allow the rabbi to go on with his speech, which is a little weird considering that you right. would have thought he would have said, you know, maybe this rabbi speech thing after he's seen the two witnesses is not the best plan for us, but he lets it go anyway. Um, and it's during that speech when the rabbi is talking in front of the camera and presumably the millions of people left on earth are watching that he proclaims Jesus Christ to be the true Messiah and not Carpathia, which then gets Carpathia all mad. Um, and that's and, and then it ends with Buck coming back home and going into a church filled with his friends singing hymns. Uh, things that made me wonder about this. I, I wonder, one, why Carpathia doesn't just pounce on Buck immediately anyway, because right. any idiot could put two and two together and figure out what has happened here. Uh, so that's really weird. Two, why did he let the rabbi go on with his speech in the first place? Because clearly something was not going according to plan, but he lets it happen. None of that makes any sense, right? What? Silence. Okay, I'm yes. going to take that as... It, no, none of it makes sense. sense. That's, yeah. that's, okay. no, that was absolute ag agreement that yeah. there's a lot of this movie that doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, well, the best part is, is the third movie <laughs> skips ahead so far that this, the end of the second movie is inconsequential. It doesn't matter. Like, all right. of the stuff that happens in the second movie does not matter as soon as the third movie begins. The second movie ends with Kirk Cameron's character, Buck, coming back home and, and being in the church, and they're all singing Christian hymns together and smiling because they realize that they've foiled the Antichrist's plan. The third right. movie opens with the president of the United States, played by Louis Gossett Jr., talking into a camcorder 
while bombs are exploding outside of the White House <laughs> and everything is on fire. <laughs> Which, by the That's way, the beginning of the movie. <laughs> I didn't get to finish the third movie, but I was sad because of that because I I got like 45 minutes into it and it was significantly more entertaining than the second one. Oh, uh, it's so much here. All right. So here are some of my notes about the third movie and I'll, I'll, I'll go through them as quickly as I can. So there was the opening that I just alluded to with the bombed out white house and, and the president essentially saying he's, he's essentially taking on responsibility for helping Carpathia reach the level of power that he did, that, that the United States helped Carpathia become this supreme power. And that's part of the reason why World War III is now breaking out. Um, but then you get, it's not clear, but the rest of the movie or most of the rest of the movie is told in flashback form. It goes back in time. Um, maybe it is clear and I just missed the transition. But to me, it just seemed like it went from that to the next scene and suddenly things didn't seem to match up anymore. Uh, so in my note, I have, uh, there's a magazine titled today weekly. Is that weird? Uh, Month yearly well, would be weird too, right? Uh, <laughs> today well, weekly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Comes out it's every the, Monday. It's, it's we do have last week left. tonight. So I don't know. Last week, <laughs> that didn't happen. So maybe yeah. this is, are we, oh wait, are you saying we're post rapture now? Because I must well, have missed according, it. <laughs> according to preterists, yes, we are post rapture. But anyway, so like, so um, tens of hundreds of people are gone. We don't know why. Uh, so uh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, in the next sequence, we're in a warehouse filled with people wearing ski masks, moving around pallets of boxes. It's revealed that the boxes contain Bibles, which need to be distributed to various locations in the United States. Cops show up and immediately shoot one of the masked folks, which prompts another one to say, we need to get these Bibles out of here. Yep. <laughs> the next scene is the president and vice president skeet shooting. The way the president talks, I have to assume his monologue at the top of the film was from a future moment in the story. In this scene, he appears to still be on Nikolai's side. The vice president reveals that he, quote unquote, knows that Nikolai is going to attack the United States, which is why he has been clandestinely trying to secure weapons for a, a militia before the U.S. completely disarms. So I assume the Oval Office scene happens later in the chronology of the story. That, in fact, is what happened. Then, as the president's leaving the skeet shooting, he and the vice president are in their car. Uh, the president's motorcade is attacked. Practical explosions are actually really impressive in this scene, which is really true. The special effects, uh, all the practical special effects in the third movie are pretty impressive. Uh, but then you get CGI rocket grenades, which look kind of weak. And then you see Lewis Gossett Jr. blue screened in to jump from an explosion, which was also not great. The vice president is killed immediately after he gives the president information important to the plot. Then two people on motorcycles show up and wipe out an entire team of terrorists saving the president. Yep. Which there's no explanation at that point. Also, uh, then worst you, Secret Service driver ever. Absolutely. Jumps out yeah, of he gets out of the car limo. and runs away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you, suckers. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Uh, then you have... Uh, uh, Kirk Cameron utters his first sil syllable in the film at 13 minutes, 30 seconds into the movie. There's a different actor playing the pastor from part two. And Kirk Cameron's character is getting married to the girl he was going to date in the second film. So I guess a significant amount of time has passed. So in the second movie, Kirk Cameron is, is sort of interested in this girl, the daughter of the pilot. And they're just kind of getting into the point where they can actually date. In fact, one of the things I didn't write in my notes about part two is one of the frustrating things is they had a, a, a tiny little subplot where the daughter misinterprets something and imagines that Buck is engaged to another woman because oh God. When she goes to yeah. Buck's apartment. What's that? Uh, you no, know, I was going to say that was, an, that was, that was 15 minutes of that film that didn't need to happen like at yeah. all. It, it happens it, and then is resolved and nothing important comes of it. She, she goes to his apartment, uh, a girl that he is allowing to stay at his place answers the door. She happens to wear an enormous engagement ring, I guess. 
I didn't even notice it in that scene. But yeah. uh, the girl, the daughter then uh, assumes that this girl is engaged to Buck and then decides that she and Buck are in a fight. Um, he eventually explains to her with no problem whatsoever that, in fact, she would, had misinterpreted everything and that he is not engaged to this woman. He's just helping her out and everything is cool and resolved. And it literally takes 15. It's 15 consecutive minutes in the movie. The only other thing that happens in that 15 minutes is Buck has a brief meeting with Nikolai that doesn't right. really matter either. So it's a full 15 minutes that could have been pulled from the movie and you wouldn't have missed it at all. At any rate, now he's getting married to this girl. So we have skipped way ahead. Like they're, they hadn't even yeah. gone on a real date yet. No, <laughs> my, the my, second movie. Well, my note, I think, slightly before I stopped watching on it was, I'm glad those two crazy kids finally got together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after all they've been through. <laughs> right. You know, that, that other 20 minutes of movie. Uh, and then also, uh, the girl's dad is getting married to uh, a woman that we've never met before. She wasn't in the second movie at all. So it's like it's a character we're supposed to care about and understand, but she was totally absent from the second film. And I'm pretty sure she wasn't in the first one either. So between films two and three, this character, this this pilot has met a woman, fallen in love and proposed to her. And they're all getting married on the same day. So he's getting married the same day his daughter is getting married. Um which again was pretty odd. And then the woman he's married is the most like turn the other cheek Christian you have ever encountered in anything right. ever. And she gets pretty irritating. Oh, Rayford is his name, not just Ray. So uh, it's 23 minutes in before we see Nikolai Carpathia apart as a picture on magazine covers. So it's, it's more than 20 minutes in before we see our villain. Uh, the Antichrist has vials of biological agents that can wipe people out. You can tell it's bad shit because when it it's clear liquid until you turn the vial upside down and then it turns green. So, you know, it's seriously bad. Yeah. Uh, the president leaves with a military lady. Uh, she turns out to be one of the two motorcycle saviors earlier in the film and hides in the trunk of her car. They're, they're leaving the White House. He hides in the trunk of her car so that he can shake his security details so they can go and scope out a factory they believe is housing this biological agent. Uh, there's no telling how he got into the trunk of her car without being spotted at all. Somehow he managed to leave the White House, get to her car, and climb into the trunk of her car with no one knows. Again, his Secret Service were shit, right? Uh, you d then find out what the Antichrist plan is. So Ayaz, the Antichrist has a biological agent. It's essentially a super virus. Okay. How, how do you think he's going to distribute the super virus to kill off his enemies? Water supply. It's not even that it's, it's, he, he has a very specific set of enemies, right? Who are, who are the Antichrist's enemies? Christians. Messiah? Yeah. So the Christians how are does gone. He tar how does he... Well, no, the people who are now converting to Christ so all that right. they can... All right. So how does no, he... No, it's not... Wait, 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 hang on. Is it, is it communion? He poisons no. the Bibles. Oh, that's even so dumber. The, the oh, Bibles at the beginning of... The Bibles in the beginning of the movie that everyone are trying to steal out of the warehouse, those giant pallets of Bibles have all been treated with a biological toxin that then get distributed to all the people who are would be Christian converts who then Question. get really sick and die. Question. Yes. If these are converts, they obviously have their own Bibles. Why are they getting new Bibles? Well, clearly the Bible supply has run really low in post rapture mm. world. <laughs> there aren't all the, like you, you would think that there'd be plenty of Bibles left from all the people who were called home. Like they had to have had Bibles <laughs> because they Good had accepted thought. Christ. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> so if you ransack no. the house, you're right. It would be a biblical uh, uh, overflow. Any empty house would be guaranteed to have at least one Bible in it. But in the hotels. Instead they, instead they have to go and – yeah, exactly. Instead they have to go and get these pallets of Bibles, which have all been treated with this toxin. 
this, by the way, is not discovered until pretty late in the movie that this is the distribution method of the toxin is through the Bibles. It goes on for quite some time before that's revealed to the heroes wait, wait, wait. who by that point wait, are all sick. The toxin through the Bibles? Yeah. They, that's fantastic. They shoot, that's... they shoot green mist. You actually see like these big, these big gas containers. Like, like I am see so in the sad. Line that I did not watch the end of this I movie. I have to watch this now, guys, by the way. This, <laughs> this is, this is yeah. coming off really I fun. I told you we should have picked this one after How? I saw well, only, But again, it really only affects you big time if you've seen the second one first because the, the difference between the second and the third one, I mean, the, the second one is so earnest that it kind of makes you feel a little uncomfortable, right? The third one is so over-the-top batshit crazy but it's awesome, but you kind of have to enjoy, well, endure the second one to get to the third one. <laughs> How is the pacing uh, of the third one? Is it, is, does it feel like it's moving quickly? Or Jesus, is it like the third one moves pretty fucking fast. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's gotta because... be the quote on the DVD box. <laughs> Jesus, the Jesus. third one moves pretty fucking fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody should make up a, a mock-up cover that somebody will be me later on tonight. Um, <laughs> Because well, nobody ever does anything on this show. Well, here comes the next part. All right, I, I, I have to, I have to get to the end of the third movie. So we get to a point where the president, he's, he's aware of what is happening. Uh, he's trying to work with the militia to, to, <clears throat> to foil the Antichrist plan. Um, he also is working with the governments of the United Kingdom and Egypt. Uh, that are really the only two governments that are ready right now to launch any kind of counterattack against the Antichrist and the, and the incredible military power of the United Nations. Um, so he gets he gets them on the line and they're all kind of agreed to strike at a very specific time. And then his plan is to go and assassinate uh, the the Antichrist. He doesn't believe he's the Antichrist at this point. The president thinks it's just the UN secretary general who is responsible for all this, but he doesn't really buy into the antichrist part yet. So he's going to smuggle in a ceramic handgun into the, uh, the, the secretary general's headquarters, uh, the global news network or whatever, global corporate headquarters. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so he, uh, he goes to the headquarters, which is a high rise, you know, building in somewhere, I guess, uh, I don't know what city it's supposed to be in. Anyway, he goes there and he gets up to the, uh, to the antichrist office. No problem. Uh, he confronts the antichrist who essentially reveals that he yeah. knows everything that's happening. So uh, I gotta antichrist. be honest. That was, yeah. <clears throat> Eric, are you still there? I what assume you still there. I... Hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm you you froze there for a second, Eric. Can you say that again? Oh. Oh, no, I was going to say one of my notes from the first movie uh, was the, the Antichrist has horrible operational security, like yes. really bad. Uh, like the pilot stole that speech off of just a laptop that was sitting there. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, he also it's also weird because at this point, the Antichrist reveals that he knows a lot more about what's going on than he's let on. But but he also seemed genuinely upset that his plans have been foiled in the second movie. So there's a lot of dissonance here too. Right. Right. So you've got a character who is claiming to know lots of stuff and have planned for all of this. And yet there are moments where there's no one to put a show on for where he is. He seems to be genuinely upset with how things have unfolded. So right. it could just, you could just explain it away by saying he's a liar. But he also genuinely knows things that he has no power to know without being supernatural in nature. So, for example, when the president uh, encounters him, with he has his, his ceramic gun. He also has a little push button that is a transponder that will signal a satellite to fire, to, to send another signal to fire a missile on his location. So if the gun fails him, he can press the button and essentially bomb the Antichrist to hell. Again, he doesn't know he's the Antichrist at this point. So he pulls out his gun, shoots the... Well, first the Antichrist reveals that he has picked the president's pocket and and he has the, the button, which he crushes in his hand. So the button is now ineffective. He no longer... The president no longer has access to that. 
So the president pulls out his his uh, ceramic pistol and fires it at the Antichrist, unloading a clip, and the Antichrist is completely unharmed. Although the bullets do pass through him and then hit the president's secret security guard on the other side of the Antichrist, thus killing the secret security guard. But it's okay because it turns out he was a bad guy. Uh, so uh, the president kills a bad guy. He doesn't know he's a bad guy at that point. He just kills him accidentally. So then the president's spirit has been broken, right? He's, he knows he's lost. He, there's no way for him to, to beat the Antichrist. The Antichrist essentially uses his Jedi mind powers to make the president put the gun to his own head, uh, but there are no bullets left in the gun, and then he ends up using his Jedi mind powers to throw the president through a window out of this what? building. Why did I not finish this film? <laughs> I'm not done. The president falls crashes into uh, the hood of a car, like, well, the top of a car. So crumples the top of the car. The Antichrist is kind of grinning to himself and he looks down and then he sees the president slowly roll off the car. Keep in mind, this is like a 20 story building that the president's just been thrown out of. He rolls off the car and gets up and limps away. And then Carpathia says, that isn't humanly possible. Then he looks up to the sky and seems pissed off. So then I wrote, aw, snap. <laughs> At that point, it, it the totally president goes back snap. to the Oval Office. This is when World War III is now in full effect because the uh, Carpathia has initiated attacks against the United States, uh, specifically targeting the cities where growing Christian populations right. are. Yeah, shit just got real. And, God stepped in. It's Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he also initiated attacks against the UK and Egypt before they could attack according to their plan. So everyone suspects that the president has actually revealed what the militia's plan was in the first place and that the president had betrayed everybody. The president comes back, tries to explain that he didn't betray everybody, but no one believes him. He then goes to the Oval Office, and this is the point at the beginning of the movie where World War III is going on, the, the White House is in flames, and that's when Buck, who has been told by God to stand still, he, that, that is his, he, he saw in a vision that he was supposed to do nothing. And it was a real test of his faith because at that point, his wife, his new wife had come down with the illness because she had been handling all those corrupted Bibles. Uh, and he, he was not in the um, church when this happened. So he was not there when she got sick. He has been told by God in a vision to stand still. So he cannot, he cannot do anything. He can't act until finally he's given the, the clearance from the big guy upstairs. And he right. goes and tracks down the president in the oval office and has a heart to heart with him where the president, uh, uh, confesses his sins and accepts Jesus Christ. Thus, having the big turnaround for the president who then decides Buck, that he seems to have that? that effect on people. I was he just going to say Buck, Buck has that effect on people. Yeah. He's a very, he's a very earnest man. So then, uh, the president takes from his desk drawer, another satellite transponder button and decides he's going to go and pay another visit to Carpathia just to slow him down. He realizes he can't kill the antichrist. He, he has accepted that fact that there is no way to kill him, but he can slow him down. And the way he's going to slow him down is by blowing up his building. So he walks back to Carpathia's headquarters, which I guess must be in D.C. And uh, at this point, no, none of the security can see him because God is protecting the president at this point because the president has accepted Jesus. So God's like, all right, now we can work together. I'm on your side. So president walks through unseen, like the security guards are looking right where the president is, but they don't see him. His midichlorian count is way too high. He gets into the elevator. They see that the elevator doors <laughs> open and close, but no one is apparently in the elevator because, again, the president seems to be invisible to him. Goes up to the penthouse floor where Carpathia is. Carpathia can see him, and he says, uh, you know, he's, he's surprised that the president has come back, uh, and he's just going to throw him out a window again or kill him some other way. And that's when the president reveals that he, in fact, has another transponder ponder button. And he just pressed the button and a missile comes in and blows up the headquarters. So presumably the president sacrifices himself. Um, one might argue that that was actually an act of suicide and the president ends up in hell. One could argue that since he did effectively kill himself. 
Although mm -hmm. I guess the sacrifice yourself makes it more of a gray area. Again, I'm not a theologian, so I don't know exactly where God would come <laughs> down on this one. Well, but, wait a uh, second. L let me let me step in some murky waters here. Yeah. Why the hell not? It's a hundredth episode. Do. Why not mess with this? <laughs> so, yeah. The 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 quickest thing I will say. You had Jesus sacrifice himself, and he had a pretty good relationship with God in the fact that he was God, so he's cool with himself. Uh, that's yeah, uh, he's, that's obvious. He's one he's one well, third of the the, yeah. the the big team. Exactly. So like, Generally of course you're given. Okay. So we had the president because I've been paying attention, the president falling out of a twenty story building. Yeah. Surviving. So obviously now God's like, This is my boy. Not his son, but my boy. So and not and yet, yet this is before the president has actually accepted Jesus Christ as his. Well, savior. I mean, there's for for God, there's no time. He knows what's going to be eventually. So this guy actually should have been taken up in the rapture. That's a whole other ball of wax. I'm not. Well, gonna not get only to that, that but he probably shouldn't have been allowed to be thrown out of a window. I mean, that really just kind of slowed down the whole thing. They could have skipped a good twenty minutes of plot. Well, th there's <laughs> lots of important trials for. God's pals. Anyhow, but if he already knows what it's going to happen. Then isn't that just a really sadistic approach to metaphysical control? I mean, if I, you know the fate of every single person I, from the beginning of time, <laughs> you're really just forcing them to act out this sort of puppet show in yeah. front of you. And, well, and, yeah, and welcome, welcome that's the whole problem with the entire rapture thing. <laughs> if you just know the plan, then what's going on here? Yeah. And why have the people born at all? Why live 2,000, 3,000 years? Why do any of this? Why l allow three or four major religions to pop up? A anyway, I'm just saying that in this movie, <laughs> trying to stay within movie logic, that since this guy is God's boy, that the death of the person, even though it's a suicide, is a sacrifice so he's probably not going to hell because he's also the president. Let's just get that right. His president's, you know, really fancy. That's my point. Right. Not a good one, but I wanted to say it. Not a good one, well, but a statement. <laughs> the, the very end of the movie, so the president has blown up Carpathia's headquarters. Uh, Buck is heading back to be with his wife, who is now extremely sick. The pastor is, is on death's door from the poison Bibles and he's about to die. And the pastor asked to take communion one last time. And he dies before he's able to drink wine. Uh, but the, the family, the Rayford, his daughter and his new wife are the, uh, decide that they're going to complete communion because that's what the pastor would have wanted. The wife takes a sip of red wine and is miraculously cured of her illness. And then they discover that by taking communion, you can be cured of it and that all you need is the red wine and that's it. That's that'll, that'll fix it. Buck shows well, up. Everybody's happy, but then there's kind of this cliffhanger about what's going to happen next. And then there was never another movie made. So you'd have to read the books. And there are only, there are only four, 14 more <laughs> books in that series. <laughs> to be fair, some of the books, like the first book that was written was left behind, right? That was the moment of the rapture on is where the books start. But later books, significantly later, were written as prequels to explain things like the birth of the Antichrist and his his journey to becoming Nikolai Carpathia. So three of the books are actually prequels to the first novel. So uh, Still, if you take those three that's... out, there's only 13 books. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, Eric, I, I'm sad that we didn't pick number three. We should have picked number three, but how are we to know, honestly? We, there was no way of knowing. There was no way. Uh, heathens like us, we had no chance. But now, you know, we were blind, and now we see. <laughs> that's a, Also, yeah, that's... The, the weird angelic character in part two who manages to, to save... Uh, Buck and the rabbi, or no, it's Rayford. By she manages to save Rayford by taking his hand and singing "Amazing Grace." It's a little much. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, that entire scene. I like. I have a note on that. That's just uh, what just happened. Someone singing "Amazing Grace" and shit got real. That was a good distraction, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Someone sang "Amazing Grace" and shit got real. <laughs> All right. So so. Uh, this is not the most offensive movie we've seen. Apparently the third one is amazing. Who's got the next pick? 
Uh, I think it's technically supposed to be me, but I don't think I have anything ready. Hang on a second. Let me let me pull up. All right. So place. so Jonathan's going to figure that out. Sure. So Eric, unless you've been living under a rock today, nine nine, uh, Apple event happened. Phones. Just talk phones alone. Interested? Not interested. Uh, I I I I can't go back on what I said, but today is the first day that I have ever actually considered getting an iPhone. To be honest, iPhone uh, six and iPhone six plus was, were announced. Uh, the, 4. the six 7, plus, 5.5. Yeah, yep. the, the six plus I would definitely grab because, like, is honestly, Apple- I need, like, I need that larger screen. Like, I, I've been on Android and I'm used to big screens and they're glorious. I'm, <laughs> I'm pissed that the uh, four point seven has such a low resolution screen. It's like seven twenty p. Yeah, it's four point seven yeah. inches. Like, get a fucking ten eighty p screen in there. And they didn't do yeah, that. They, well, they yeah, stick really retina in everything else. It's going to be like, two inches on your face. <laughs> hey, listen, if I'm, I read a lot, if you don't know this, and I like having the stuff look like paper. Is that crazy? Oh, so that's what you're doing when you're not watching the PWP movies. That's right. <laughs> also, I've watched... Okay, have you seen Blackfish, Eric, while Jonathan looks for... We are not picking Blackfish, yes, by the way. I have. Dude, We're not that, is, that. that is so depressing. You are you are the you are the slowest person on the bandwagon for that movie. <laughs> hey, but yes, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not on a bandwagon. I just was looking at the uh, a list of best documentaries on Netflix, and I watched yeah. that, and I, it was really well done and yeah, yeah, horrific. Yeah, totally. And so, oh, so, and and Sea World's already saying that they're like already losing funding, like tons of cash. Yeah, if you haven't so, watched like, Blackfish. So Blackfish is offensive, but not in the same way Rock and Roll Frankenstein is. Well, it's just offensive to your sense leaves, of fairness to animals. Yeah, it leaves you oh, out. Oh, I know what one you're talking about now. It yes. leaves you outraged. I wouldn't say it's I, – oh, I guess offensive is, is the word. Yeah. I think it's I'm, intentionally offensive. Like it's, You're supposed to offend your sensibilities as a person. Who right. Goes, I'm not totally. going to see world it, anymore. You yeah, fuckers have, yeah. have ruined the lives of right. very intelligent animals. Right. And like, wow, just – depressing on a related note have either of you seen the movie surf nazis must die no <laughs> no right, that's it that's our that's uh, our next one surf nazis <laughs> must die will be episode 101 plus to my list can when we the just watch a good movie devastates again? the california coastline groups of neo-nazi punks take over this traumatized futuristic romp oh is it actually trauma it says oh, traumatized okay. So I don't know, but it's it's best guess for me is like one point something stars. One point seven average is two point five. Dude, I have one point five. Sweet. Called again? Surf Nazis. Surf Nazis must die. I don't think I need to type more than surf Nazis in the search engine, (laughs) considering I assume surf Nazis got no reason to live. There's surf Nazis and the world of tomorrow. (laughs) <laughs> oh yep this is a trauma movie it's Surf been added Nazis to my list tribulation force it's even <laughs> though i rate really crappy movies five stars on this account oh so yeah. oh, this is my regular account never mind sorry my regular account says one star i need to get this off oh, my wow. regular list now just one for you one and like a quarter wow. okay so yeah you've got 1.5 yeah. eric and i've got 1.7 i don't yeah. know what the, Look, does this thing know I'm bald? Because I'm not a skinhead. <laughs> you love it. You will totally yeah. love it. That's weird. unless they think you're a surfer. Yeah, I'm definitely not that. I'm neither of those things. I was speaking uh, of Netflix things. There's Netflix did uh, picked up Trailer Park Boys apparently too. Oh yeah, that's true. So yeah. that's a Netflix original. Didn't know that, but okay. So for for my for my lousy account, it's two and a half stars. <laughs> so so right. you're right there in the average. Yeah, that's. Oh boy, this is going to be great. So, I, I will try to remember this it's, for next. It's time. trauma. You know, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> like, yeah. If yeah, if, I have a feeling this is going to be terribly, like, incredibly tasteless and offensive on purpose. Yeah. And uh, and if and I don't know that I'll get through it because I mean I'm, I've watched I've tried to watch several trauma films and trying to watch one all by yourself. Is oh, it's rarely impossible. as much. It's you can't not do fun. It. Not the, fun. The, I have not tried Romeo and Juliet, which is the James Gunn one. But okay, it's only eighty-two minutes, so that that's a yeah. plus. 
and yeah. it's yeah. it's from 1987, so it's got to be terrible. And the movie poster is phenomenal. It yeah. is a Nazi with a a, a flamethrower <laughs> with a hook for a hand. Well, the hook for the hand is separate from the flamethrower hand. It's not a. It's not just a hook. It's a. It's like a metallic cr- crab. crab yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and he's and he on a is, surfboard that has a chainsaw through it. Through it, and his surf posture is completely wrong. And yeah. below that, as he is riding the tide, is a woman who is straddling a surfboard. I don't know how she's doing it because her leg is beyond the surfboard. Yeah, cowering in fear it's... of the surf Nazi. <laughs> There's also an explosion, and if you look carefully in the background, oh, that is. looks like it's the head of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> is that what? what that is? I I don't think so. I think it's just something else in the background. A, I, I'm zooming in. It's a palm tree. It is a palm the, tree. The, yeah, I think it is a palm tree. It's just because there's like something else in the background that makes it look like that on my screen. Uh, it also looks like the, the posture that the Nazi is taking is the classic... Uh, if I tell you to stand like a crab, this is how every human being stands, right? It's like the Zoidberg pose. Yeah, actually. It yeah, is. no, it is. Totally is. <laughs> and thanks to Eric, I have that Chrome uh, extension for the Rotten Tomato information. Oh, Critics, God. 20% fresh, 32% fresh from audiences. What critics thought it was good? Whatever. All right. <laughs> Anyway, well, I, I'm sure it's critics that that only review schlock. So right. what I thought it what was a hundred what a hundredth episode this has been. Let's look into the future. Yeah. Next time hey guys, on podcast. Guys, I, uh, I my house is full of locusts. My foot hurts. I. I really didn't think surf Nazis would be more evangelical than left behind, but uh, I don't know. They make good points. 